We know COVID-19 may have a lasting impact on your heart and lungs. Now we're learning more about the effects on your brain. A new study out of London is shedding light on some of the cognitive effects of the virus, even after recovery. And one of them is a drop in IQ. Our nine health expert, Dr. Powell Coley, is taking a closer look at the findings. Good morning, Dr. Coley. Thanks for joining us. So what did this study show? Uh, good morning, Natasha. So this was a study of about 85,000 people from the Imperial College in London. And essentially, they looked at anyone with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 infection, all the way from those that had mild infection and recovered at home to those that ended up in the intensive care unit. And exactly as you said, even after the signs and symptoms of the acute infection had resolved, there were persistent and lingering cognitive deficits that seemed to persist for weeks or months afterwards. And they adjusted for factors like age, gender, underlying medical problems, education, income, even race. And despite all these adjustments, there appeared to be these persistent cognitive deficits. So it's our first glimpse into the fact that COVID-19 may, you know, not just affect our organs, but may affect our thinking and our cognitive function. Was there anything that predicted a greater decline in IQ? And this is what was very interesting. There was one factor that emerged very strongly as predicting who would have the largest decline in IQ, and that was the severity of the infection. So if you looked at those that had very severe infection, required respiratory support, or were in the intensive care unit, they had an 8.5 drop in IQ, which is equivalent of about 10 years of aging of the brain. But even if you looked at those that had mild infection and recovered at home, they had a four point drop in their IQ, which is the equivalent of about five years of aging of the brain. And what's very interesting is that the authors actually compared the cognitive effects to having strokes or microbleeds. That's how profound they were. And these types of drops in IQ, just to give you perspective, do impact your daily functioning. They affect things like the ability to carry on a conversation, to concentrate, to recall facts. So they are certainly significant. Yeah, this is very, very alarming. I mean, even five to 10 years of aging. Um, I do want to mention that there's been a lot of criticism of the IQ test, arguing that it's culturally biased. Is there information on the demographics of the group who was tested in the study? You know, it is certainly the IQ test is not the best metric to assess intelligence. And you're absolutely right that it has been found to be culturally biased because it doesn't necessarily incorporate many of the different factors that come in. And this was one of the criticisms of the study. Now, the study was, uh, you know, racially diverse. And as I said before, they did adjust for race in the study. So we don't think that that factor is playing in here. But in general, it doesn't appear to be a good test to look at intelligence. So really other types of cognitive performance tests may be preferred. In addition, you really have to think about, you know, uh, the circumstances under which you're administering the test and the types of people that are taking the test to really get a comprehensive picture of how to assess somebody's cognitive function. And finally, the study was not peer reviewed. So that's another criticism of this study. So we do have to take it with a tiny grain of salt, but we do know from other viruses in general that people who have viral infections and lots of inflammation can have persistent cognitive deficits from that. You kind of touched on this in the last answer there, but you know, what outstanding questions still remain from the study. You know, I think the biggest outstanding question really is the mechanism. So how does a virus that's a respiratory virus, like we've talked about, affect our thinking, our personality, our recall, our ability to carry on conversations, even in those that have mild infections? So when it's very severe, you can, you know, postulate that possibly inflammation is playing a role in affecting the brain function. But if you've had a mild infection and recovered at home, what are the mechanisms that are causing these types of deficits? So we really need more studies. And as we have more people recovering, Cover, I think I'm hoping we'll have more databases which will help us to answer these difficult questions. Yeah, we're learning everything in real time. That's uh, pretty much how it's going. Dr. Coley, thank you so much for coming on the show.